We'll turn now to the third case on today's docket, Rogers versus the State Board. May it please the court, Mose Brace on behalf of Mr. Rogers. I'd like to focus on issue one regarding the jury instructions and time permitting issue five regarding the court's handling of the mitigation. This case is about ensuring that the process of sentencing a man to die is fair, that it increases confidence in the criminal law, and that it's deliberate and considered. More specifically, this case revolves around two issues. One, whether a jury must reach a subjective state of certitude as to determinations that increase the penalty for first degree murder from life without parole to death. And two, whether a trial judge can summarily address and dispose of proposed, proposed mitigation when selecting a sentence of death over a sentence of life without parole. Regarding issue one, I'd like to make one point, and if possible, four contentions in support of that main point. The main point is that, as this court recognized in Perry v. State, determinations as to whether the aggravation is sufficient to justify imposing the death penalty and whether the aggravation outweighs the mitigation must be made beyond a reasonable doubt. And in support of that general point, I'd like to first note that elements as well as the functional equivalent of elements must be determined beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a key takeaway from the Apprendi line of cases. Number two, these determinations at issue here today are the functional equivalent of elements. Didn't we say the opposite in Foster? Taken at face value, Justice Luck, yes, Foster did say differently. My position is that in order to be reconciled with the Apprendi line of cases, especially Ring, Foster must be read narrowly. And if it is read narrowly, then it would have no application in Mr. Rogers' case. Why? Well, if I could start by, well, let me say this. I believe that Foster should be read, can and should be read to establish that determinations as to whether at least one aggravating factor exists, as to whether the aggravation is sufficient, and as to whether the aggravation out the, outweighs the mitigation, Foster can be read to establish that those determinations were not the functional equivalent of elements in 1998 at the time that Mr. Foster was tried. If it's read that way, and, and here's why I suggest that it can and should be read that way, Mr. Foster essentially argued that Hearst v. State merely clarified what had been a long existing law in Florida. In Foster, this court said, quote, Hearst was a change in the decisional law. And it later said that the 2016 and 2017 amendments to 921-141 codified those changes. And that is significant because unlike but where But you also say that under the statute and the rule that we do not find this to be elements? It did say that, yes, sir. And the statute it was talking about was this, that statute. It, yes, taken at face value, yes, it did, okay. Justice Luck. And, and so to turn to that point, I would say that if Foster is taken at face value, uh, essentially what Foster appears to reason is that <clears throat> in Florida, the maximum penalty for first degree murder based on a conviction for first degree mur murder alone is death. And the reasoning seems to be that 78204, which defines first degree murder, characterizes first degree murder as a quote, capital felony, end quote. And then the reasoning seems to be like, seems to be that therefore, by definition, first degree murder or capital felony is punishable by death. But that is the exact same argument essentially that the United, United States Supreme Court rejected in Ring v. Arizona. And if I could elaborate on that quickly. In Ring, Arizona basically argued the maximum penalty for first degree murder is death because their first degree murder statute, which I, well their first degree murder statute said that first degree murder is quote punishable by life imprisonment or death and the united states supreme court rejected that argument it said that the arizona first degree murder statute authorizes death only in a formal sense and it noted that that first degree murder statute which i believe may have been 13-1103 i do know this is at pages 603 through 604 of the ring opinion but their first degree murder statute explicitly cross-referenced another statute that required more than a conviction for first degree murder. Similarly, 78204 in Florida cross-references 775082, which in turn cross-references 921141. 
And clearly more than just a conviction for first degree murder is required in order for the maximum penalty to be increased from life without parole to death. That's why I suggest that if Foster is read at face value, it's just simply irreconcilable with the Apprendi line of cases, particularly Ring v. Arizona. In terms of the determinations at issue today increasing the maximum penalty for murder, um, again, I would point out that 782.04 cites to 775.082, which essentially says the maximum penalty for a capital felony is life without parole unless the procedures outlined in 921.141 result in a determination that a sentence of death should be imposed. And, and so then we're at 921.141. And, and to oversimplify, it essentially says you've got to determine, you've got to determine whether at least one aggravating factor exists. It then lays out additional determinations that have to be made. And it's important for me to step back a moment and point out that the appropriate analysis when determining whether a finding increases the penalty concerns the operation and effect of the law as applied and enforced by the state. That, that's a clear principle laid down by the United States Supreme Court, actually in Milani versus Wilbur, and that's what Apprendi, the Apprendi line of cases built on. So uh, a, a different way to state that, which is how the court states it in Apprendi, is that the relevant inquiry is one not of form but of effect. Does the required finding expose the defendant to increased punishment? And I would suggest that we, of course, start with the text, 921-141, but we have to look and see how is that applied and enforced. And, and it's very helpful, obviously, to look at the standard instructions. In particular, I would suggest to look at the standard verdict form. And what becomes apparent is that each of those determinations, not only a determination as to whether at least one aggravating factor exists, but also as to whether that aggravation is sufficient and also whether that aggravation outweighs the mitigation, each of those is a necessary determination before we even get to the point where we can consider life without parole or death. And, and I would, again, if you look at section, the fourth section, I believe it's section D of the standard verdict form, it is actually titled eligibility for the death penalty. And, and that determination, section D, pertains to whether the aggravation outweighs the mitigation. But those same standard jury instructions and verdict forms explicitly excluded, despite argument from, from a lots of different folks, the reasonable doubt standard, correct? Yes, the current version of the standard. So if we look to that as an example, doesn't that indicate to us that there was no error in failing to uh, instruct on the standard of proof for the outweighing element and for the, the actual element of what sentence to, or the sufficiency element? Well, well Justice Luck, as, as, as we all know, when this court authorized those standard instructions for publication, they explicitly said, you know, we express no opinion to the correctness of these instructions. So. Um, I do take it to mean that this court closely examined the positions of the parties. But that's certainly true, yes, sir. and I think that's true in the normal case, but these were not the average instructions that we get. The average instructions we get are they're proposed by one of the standard instruction committees. They come up to us, we look over them, and we uh, issue an opinion and put that disclaimer on there. These originated from the court. We then asked for comment for six, within 60 days. We got extensive comments and thanked a lot of different parties, including those who raised the exact same issues you've raised here in this case. And and you, the court unanimously, even though there's a separate concurring opinion, but not on this issue, unanimously reaffirmed the fact that the beyond a reasonable doubt standard was not included in those elements that you contest here, or those, I shouldn't say elements, on those, those indications on the statute that, that, you, uh, that you are contesting here. Justice Luck, I, I mean, certainly the court did not include those in the standard instructions. I, I, I would take the position that as thorough as a process that was, it was not litigation. It, you know, it was not tested by, by, this, by this process. Let's and, step back just conceptually. Yes, what, what, I, what I, I understand that you have a standard of proof that applies to a, a finding with respect to the existence of an aggravator. Yes, sir. Okay, that makes perfect sense to me. That's a factual question, does it exist or not? But when it comes to the question of the sufficiency of the aggravator, or the weighing of the aggravation and mitigation, I'm having trouble understanding how that is really a matter of proof. I mean, that's, those aren't really factual questions. That's a question about the judgment of the, the jury. So it just seems like to me to be a conceptual problem to, to attempt to apply a standard of proof to those determinations. What am I missing there? 
Well, Justice Kennedy, in short, what I would say is that even those, these determination, even though these determinations are not purely factual and involve what I would call the exercise of normative judgment, they're still subject to the constitutional requirement of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And, and I would try to make three points in support of that. The first point would be that these determinations are ultimate or elemental facts. And the United States Supreme Court has distinguished between ultimate or elemental facts and basic or evidentiary facts. And, and so, for instance, in the Apprendi line of cases, when it refers to facts, I believe it is referring to ultimate or elemental facts. The second point would be that these determinations and determinations that juries have to make beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, but in the yes, Apprendi sir. line of cases, they, that talks about the existence of an aggravator. That's what they're talking about. Yes, now, sir. Obviously, our court maybe had, uh, has had a di different understanding about that, but that's clear in the, that line of cases. Well, I, I agree, Justice Kennedy, but I would say that, that the specific reference to an aggravating circumstance arises in large part from the Ring decision and the death penalty statute at issue in Ring, the Arizona statute back in 2001, I believe differs in a critical respect from Florida's death penalty statute. And, and what I would say is this, the Ring statute, again, the first degree murder referred to the Ring death, what I would call the Ring death penalty statute. That death penalty statute in relevant part essentially said the court, because at that point, you know, the Arizona required the court to make these decisions, but I don't think that matters for our purposes here. It said the court essentially shall determine whether at least one aggravating factor exists. It then said, if so, it must make a determination as to whether, and I believe this is more or less a quote, mitigating circumstances sufficiently substantial to call for leniency, end quote, exist. Now, in contrast to that determination under the Florida statute, after at least one aggravating factor is found. Well, yes, sir. Me, I'm having the same analytical problem that Justice Kennedy um, just articulated, and, and I want to delve further into that. Isn't it correct that the instructions in terms of mitigators and everything that comes after the actual factual findings tells the jury that this is an individual determination. Each of you have to determine whether something is mitigating. Somebody may determine that something's mitigating in their mind, but it, because it's an exercise of judgment, somebody else may not think it's mitigating. You don't have to agree unanimously on what's mitigating, correct? I do agree, yes, okay. as to I mean, the mitigating circumstances. Right. So I, I just can't reconcile the argument that you should treat it as a fact and a, and attach a standard of proof to something that in the same instructions we tell the jury is not a fact and in fact really isn't a fact. I mean, it's, it's, it's an individual judgment call based on what that jury, and we tell the jurors that. I, I, I don't see how you can do both well, without being yes, irreconcilably confusing. Yes, sir. Well, Justice Lawson, I do believe that the instructions make it clear that the individualized determination is to the existence of, of, of the mitigating circumstances. Of, of course, then it has to be unanimous as to whether the aggravation outweighs the mitigation. Um, right. And, 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 and so I would, what, what I would say, I would try to make two more points in terms of why these determinations are subject to the constitutional requirement of proof beyond reasonable doubt. One is that Many determinations. Wouldn't it be like telling a trial, in, in Florida, trial judges generally have discretion to sentence up to the maximum penalty authorized by law and generally. It, it would be, almost be like saying to the trial judge, I know this is a discretionary decision. Different trial judges are going to view it necessar differently necessarily. But, um, but you need to announce on the record that you believe beyond a reasonable doubt that your sentence is the correct. I mean, it, it just it just doesn't even fit to me. I, I'm struggling with that. Yes, sir. Well, I do think this is different, Justice Lawson, then. These determinations don't go to selecting a sentence. They go in, to increasing the penalty from life without parole to death in the first place. And, and, and I think that's critical because, you know, resulting in the outcome that Mr. Rogers is suggesting here w would not have an impact on sentencing within a range. This is about these findings, these determinations increasing the penalty. But, but if I could circle back to, to the question about the factual or non-factual nature, I believe that many determinations that juries make beyond a reasonable doubt have both a factual component and an application of a standard to the facts component. And, and, and one, it's, one example of that would be in the United States Supreme Court case of U.S. v. Galden, there essentially the government argued, the, the issue dealt with the materiality element. And, and, 
In essence, the government argued that only the factual components of that element, you know, what statement was made, what decision was the state, the person to, the, to which the statement made, what, what was that decision, those factual components had to be decided by the jury beyond a reasonable doubt, but the judge could decide what effect that statement had on the decision maker. And the United States Supreme Court rejected that and said jurors have to determine all those things. It said that jurors not only determine facts, but they can draw inferences from the facts, conduct delicate assessments of the facts, and, and, and determine the significance of those inferences. Furthermore, other determinations have both a factual component and an application of what I would call a normative standard to facts component. For instance, one example would be obscenity, whether the material depicts sexual conduct in a patently offensive way. Another example could be the especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel aggravator, which essentially asks a jury to determine beyond a reasonable doubt whether the murder was extremely wicked or vile, conscienceless or pitiless. And I would say a third example, you could look to this court's relatively recent decision in Brown v. State. Essentially there the court said that a determination as to whether a non-state prison sanction could present a danger to the public was the functional equivalent of an element. And, and again, there, in all three of those scenarios, you have to determine the purely historical facts, the underlying facts, and then apply a standard. And I would suggest a standard that is, that is normative. Um, so, so I think it's important to, to recognize the various components that these determinations involve. The third and final point I would like to make in, in terms of the factual nature of, of these determinations is that even if these determinations are not susceptible to a quantum of proof, they're susceptible to a subjective state of certitude. And, and I say that in this sense. Perhaps it would be difficult for a juror, juries to say, well, the aggravation outweighs the mitigation by X quantity of proof. But I think even if that is the case, they would still be able to ask themselves, ask themselves do I have an abiding conviction that by some degree, by some degree, the aggravation outweighs the mitigation? And, and, and on that point, I would note that multiple states require these determinations to be made beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so, so I think that, that in short, even though these determinations are not purely factual and involve the exercise of, of normative judgment, that alone does not mean that they're not um, subjected to the constitutional requirement of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, if I could circle back um, to these determinations increasing the penalty for the crime, I, I just want to make sure and, and, and point out that 921-141, and this sort of circles back to comparing the Florida statute to the Arizona statute, um, the Arizona statute, as I said, required a, an aggravator and then also mitigating circumstances not sufficiently substantial to call for leniency. Whereas here we're talking about whether the aggravation is sufficient and whether the aggravation outweighs the mitigation. And I would suggest that those determinations differ in kind from the second determination in Arizona. The second determination in Arizona was essentially about do we come down from a maximum penalty? Whereas these, whether the aggravation is sufficient to justify imposing death and whether the aggravation outweighs the mitigation, those are about seeing if we get to the maximum in the first place. Um, and I think that's a critical point. And, and, and so, Justice Kennedy, that kind of brings me back to the United States Supreme Court referring to aggravating circumstances. I do think that is arising from the Ring decision and, and the Ring statute. And, and I would suggest that that, that Florida statute differs. Um, I would also point I mean, out, that, I, yes, sir. I, mean, I, I think I understand your argument, but the whole concept of aggravation suggests going up. Yes, but, but I think that whether the aggravation is sufficient to justify the death penalty, I think that's about going up. I think that is about going up, and I think that's in contrast to whether the mitigation is sufficiently substantial to call for leniency. I do think that's about coming down. Um, and, and I think that that is, and I will admit, it's, it's, a subtle, it's a subtle point, but I think that these determinations are different from telling a judge, okay, the just, just, yes, I mean, it, it, it seems that your argument seems completely in, inconsistent with what we, how we treat the entire case. In other words, if if you're suggesting that the law is that we have 12 jurors who are going to make a personalized normative determination about whether the death penalty should be imposed to a standard that's an evidentiary standard, then why would we go through the voir dire process and exclude people who just don't believe in the death penalty? 
Well, I mean, just, because that, that's a norm, that's a societal norm that a lot of people share. So if, it, if it's not to be a, a, a factual determination that can be made to a standard based on the evidence, a legal standard in the evidence, which is what impartial jurors are supposed to be doing, if it's just a norm of whether 12 people think the death penalty should be imposed, then why, why would, I mean, it, it, do you understand the question? I, I do, Justice Lawson, but I think that what you're referring to when you talk about it being a personalized, sort of individualized decision, that's really about the final step, which is whether death is appropriate. Right, but you're saying that that should be subjected, to, they no. should be instructed, do you find that beyond a reasonable doubt? Well, no, sir, I'm not. I'm saying so that the, fir the, 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 the determination as to whether the aggravation is sufficient and outweigh the mitigation should be the final determination as to whether death is appropriate, which this court has labeled the mer or at least involving the mercy recommendation, I'm not suggesting that that should be beyond a reasonable doubt, because I do think as the United States Supreme Court indicated in Kansas v. Carr, mercy is not strained. And, and I do think that it's difficult to say, does a person deserve mercy beyond a reasonable doubt? But again, that individualized point really comes in in the final determination as to whether death or life is appropriate. I'm talking about the determinations as to whether the aggravation is sufficient and whether it outweighs the mitigation. But the Supreme Court said that in Carr in the context of the equipose statute, correct? Yes. Then how, how is that any different than our, our weight, which is not equipose, it, it's one more than the other, but yes, sir. how can we treat that any differently? Well, or why should we? Yes, sir. I, I would say, Justice Luck, that that, that that portion of the Carr opinion is, is dicta. I mean, it begins by saying, um, in the abstract and considered without respect to our capital sentencing case law. So, a, there, there's, there's one judge that I've read who said there's dicta, and then there's Supreme Court dicta, um, and they don't often opine on, on on issues of law, and when they do, it's something we should all pay attention to. Yes, sir. I, I think even you would agree with that. Yes, uh, yes. So I, I'm not saying that disposes right. of the issue alone. Right. I'm not saying that means it shouldn't be persuasive, but why it should not be persuasive is that portion of the Carr opinion really, um, it, it, it confuses a determination as to whether a death eligible pen defendant deserves mercy with a determination as to whether the aggravation outweighs the mitigation. And, and, and it's certainly in the context of, of the selection phase um, as opposed to the eligibility phase. And I'm suggesting that under Florida statute, these determinations are eligibility determinations, not selection factors. But, but the bottom line is that, as I said a moment ago, I do think it's hard to assert the position that a defendant deserves mercy beyond a reasonable doubt. But I think that's different from whether the aggravation outweighs the mitigation. I think a juror can ask, do I have an abiding conviction that at least by some amount, the aggravation outweighs the mitigation? So that's the primary reason why I believe the car musings should not be persuasive and controlling here. Let me, let me take you back to this distinction you're trying to make between our statute and the Arizona statute. Yes, sir. Isn't it true that in um, uh, the Hearst case at the U.S. Supreme Court, they treated the, the question before them really as simply involving an, a, a, a straightforward application of, uh, of, of ring uh, to, uh, to the Florida statute. I mean, there's nothing about this kind of distinction. I mean, that's just that, that distinction you're making is really uh, would be something that would be foreign or certainly not within anything with, uh, in the analysis from the U.S. Supreme Court. Isn't that correct? In, in Hearst v. Florida? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I, although I would say this, Justice Kennedy. They're, they're, they're or anywhere else. Right, that is correct. Uh, although I don't know if this argument has been advanced in, in the court, but I would note that in Hearst v. Florida, there is a portion of the f opinion that refers to the defendant not being eligible for death until there are findings. And it does say eligible until findings as to whether the aggravation is sufficient and whether it outweighs the mitigation. So th there is tension within the four corners of the Hearst v. Florida opinion, but that portion, I do believe, supports the argument that I'm trying to make. Um, in the sense that these are eligibility determinations. One last point I'd like to make, as I know I'm getting close to my rebuttal time, is that instructing the jury to make these determinations beyond a reasonable doubt, it would further interest underlying the constitutional requirement of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. In particular, it would promote fairness and it would promote confidence in the criminal law. And that is because the beyond a reasonable doubt standard reduces the margin of error as to the capital defendant, 
and the capital defendant has at stake interest of extraordinary, I'm sorry, state has at stake interests that are extraordinary, not only liberty, but life. And unless there are additional questions right now, I will reserve the balance of my time for the I, I just yes, want sir. to clarify, you, you agree, I guess, that your issue four does not have merit whatsoever? Issue four? Issue four, that reversible error occurred when finding the prior violent felony conviction because he had not been convicted of a crime as a result of the use of violence. I mean, clearly he had the judge in the final, in, in the order listed the three crimes that he was relying on. Yes, sir. Um, that seems to be a, based on a misapprehension of the record. You didn't reply in the reply brief on that point. Is that? Well, Justice Lawson, I, I would just say that it turns on what the judge meant by when he referred to other people um, uh, against whom Mr. Rogers had used violence. And if, and, it, and if who he was referring to was only the victims and the prior felonies, then, then yes, I agree. I would suggest, though, that the better reading of the order is that the reference to other people was referring not only no, to... You argue this as if there were no... I mean, you say there were, you know, he had not been convicted of other crimes as a result of the use of the violence, and he clearly had, and it's clearly in the order. And it's clearly set forth as the basis for that finding. Yes, sir. Frankly, Justice Lawson, I, when I read the order, I thought that the reference to other people was in a separate paragraph referring to some unidentified people. Okay. When the state submitted that, I, I did recognize that there was a different reading. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Justice Kennedy, Justices of the Court, may it please the Court. My name is Jennifer Donahue. I'm an Assistant Attorney General and I represent the state in this matter. Turning to Issue 1, the sufficiency and weighing, the statute 921.1412B2 is very clear that a defendant becomes eligible for the death penalty upon the finding of guilt for first degree murder and at least one aggravating factor. The remainder of the determination in sentencing is based on a judgment call, as this court has clearly understands it the same way that the state does. The sufficiency and weighing are judgment calls for the jury to make. As Justice Scalia stated in Carr, whether mitigating circumstances outweigh aggravating circumstances is mostly a question of mercy. To assign a burden of proof especially a burden of proof such as beyond a reasonable doubt to that question of mercy does not make sense. My opposing counsel mentioned that perhaps this issue has not been presented to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, I would contend that it has. In this court's cases in denying relief based on Hitchcock, the majority of the cert petitions uh, reference the issue of the burden of proof being assigned to sufficiency and weighing and that it should be beyond a reasonable doubt. The purpose behind that is to essentially make this court um, determine that Hearst itself should be fully retroactive, thus obliterating the Hitchcock line of case law from this court. Additionally, the argument is that it should also be not subject to a test for harmfulness or harmlessness. So that is the end goal in trying to um, make this court determine that the findings for sufficiency and weighing should be determined beyond a reasonable doubt and that it was error in the first place to not do that. Obviously, since they're judgment calls, they're not, sub they're not elements. They're factual findings that the jury must make and there is no burden of proof that are assigned to those factual findings. I believe that my opposing counsel um, mentioned that he would like to talk about the mitigation issue number five. He did not get to that, um, but I just want to briefly touch on that. In Cam this court's case law in Campbell and Treese, uh, the judge is required to sh determine whether the mitigation has been established to weigh that mitigation against the aggravation and to expressly consider each mitigating factor. Here. The court has done exactly that. There's a 15-page order, I believe it's 15, in which the um, judge lists out each individual mitigating factor and explains whether the jury found that mitigating factor, whether he himself found that mitigating factor to exist. And I will uh, mention that the judge found 
some mitigating factors existed that the jury did not themselves find that. So that was a benefit in her to the defendant. That, that indicates that there was an individual consideration of each of the factors. Absolutely. In other words, if the judge was just going along with whatever the jury did, the judge would have just said, the jury found this and there's no, Absolutely. that factor hasn't been found. And that's the whole purpose between, uh, by Campbell and Treese, is we don't want a summarily dis the, the judge to, to summarily dismiss mitigating factors and not consider them. And that's absolutely evidence that the judge considered each mitigating factor individually, and he assigned different weight to each of those mitigating factors individually. Pending this court's questions, the state requests that this court affirm the judgment and sentence in this case. If I could briefly address issue five, um, the fact that the court found some mitigating circumstances that, that, that the jury did not may have indicated that there was an individualized consideration, but the sentencing order does not reflect reasoned judgment. And, and, and I think because death is irrevocable, this court has indicated that the trial court must deliberately consider the mitigating circumstances. And I believe that means thoughtfully and comprehensively analyzing. That in, in effect means giving some reasoning of an analysis in support of whether a, a, a mitigating circumstance is not proven or, or even if it is proven, um, some reasoning or analysis in, in support of why it's given the weight that, that, that the trial court gives it. Um, Didn't the trial court explain <clears throat> as to uh, certain of them that the jury heard the evidence and found that the mitigating factor did not exist? Yes. Isn't that a reason? To find it not proven? Right. Well, I, I still think the trial judge has an independent duty. And in fact, he exercised that because then there were, I think, at least six or seven of them where the trial judge said the jury found it not found. However, there was evidence to support this, and I am giving it X weight. Right, but he gave no reasoning or analysis in support of, of that X weight. And, and I would say, Justice Luck, con contrast the trial court's treatment of the aggravating factors with its, the treatment of the mitigating circumstances. As to the aggravating factors, he, had, he at least laid out some standards, summarized some of the facts, applied that, those standards to the facts. When you look at the mitigation, it's just the same basic statements after the other. It may have been 15 pages because there were 68 proposed circumstances, but it was still summarily addressing and disposing uh, of the mitigation. And, and I believe that in order for this court to meaning fit, meaningfully review the sentencing order, the, the trial court has to explain itself, has to give some reason judgment. Again, if you look at Oyola and Jackson, um, I think the court made it clear that, that, that those in those instances, the trial judge did not thoughtfully and comprehensively analyze it and, and the mitigation. And I think the same is true here. Um, Oil is based on Campbell, correct? Yes, sir. And Campbell does not have that requirement, correct? To thoughtfully and comprehensively analyze? Campbell says that when addressing mitigating circumstances, the sentencing court must expressly evaluate in its written order each mitigating circumstance proposed by the defendant to determine whether it's supported by evidence and whether, in the case of non-statutory factors, it's truly mitigating. I mean, well, Justice, that, that's what Campbell says. Kim, yes, but I believe subsequent cases such as Walker, Jackson, Oyola, they elaborate on what expressly evaluate means, and I think expressly evaluate at a minimum requires reason judgment, requires a thoughtful and comprehensive analysis. I believe it's the Walker decision that says, you know, in order to satisfy the Campbell requirement, the trial court can't treat its analysis of the mitigation like an academic exercise in which it summarily addresses and disposes of the proposed mitigation. So, no, Campbell does not elaborate on it, but subsequent cases build on this notion of expressly evaluating the mitigation. What do I do, what do we do with the two where the headings are different than the substance of the paragraph? Yes, sir. Where there is a mismatch there? Yes, um, sir. Assuming I, I agree that that's some sort of error, is that a harmless error given that there are two very two mitigating factors that were given very little weight compared to uh, the aggravating factors in this case? Well, Justice Luck, I would suggest that the treatment in those two instances reflects more broadly that it was, again, a summarily addressing and dispose of the mitigation. It was, at least in some instances, I, well, I would argue across the board, not thoughtful and comprehensive. But was it 25 mitigators that the trial judge found that the jury did not find? Is that the right number? 
I'm sorry, Justice Lawson, I don't know the exact number. Um, but again, I would say that even if the trial judge is finding some factors yeah. that the jury didn't, it a should still of, explain. A number of factors. Sir? A number of factors that the jury didn't? Yes, sir, but it should still explain why it only gave those factors relatively limited weight. I mean, that's important. That's what matters for, say, a proportionality review. You what, know, it's, what would that look like? What, what would it what, what would like an appropriate analysis look like? Well, I can give you a couple of examples, Justice Kennedy. The first proposed mitigator was whether the killing took place while the defendant was under an extreme mental or emotional disturbance. Multiple defense experts testified that Mr. Rogers struggled with impulse control, regulating his emotions. There was brain damage. Um, on the other hand, one state expert essentially said, I can't say he doesn't have brain damage because he couldn't read the PET scans, but he said, I think it's from a personality disorder. I think that in that instance, the court could have at least summarized that testimony. I mean, presumably it gave it, said it wasn't proven because it found the state expert more persuasive, but I think it should have at least done that. Um, another example would be that Mr. Rogers... How does that, yes, I mean, at the end of the day, how does that really help us in our review? Well, I mean, because we, you know, when we look at what's there, we can and we look at the evidence, we can tell what the trial court's done. I mean, so I'm, I'm struggling to understand how that elaboration really helps us perform our appellate function. I yes, mean, sir. I understand your argument, and I, and I know we've said <laughs> some things in some different cases, but I'm, I'm really struggling to understand how that uh, helps us perform the appellate function and why it's necessary. Yes, sir. Well, I think it's essentially because this court can't properly step in and reweigh the mitigation. You know, the trial judge was there, and, and I would suggest that the trial well, judge... We know his conclusions. But you don't know if they're the reasons or the analysis is supportive of it. I, would, I mean, one way to look at it is it's hard for me to argue that the trial judge abused his discretion when he gave it this way when I don't know the trial judge's reasons for it. I can only speculate. Again, that one example may have been that he found the state expert more persuasive, but it's hard for me to argue that that was an abuse of discretion when I don't know why. And, and I would suggest this, in essence, this type of error is sort of structural in the context, the unique context of a penalty phase proceeding in Florida. All right. You yes, sir. Exhausted your time. Thank you. Okay. We thank you both for your arguments. Now we'll move. To